Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be looking at linear models. And we're going to have to look at a number of different types of equations and recall equations that you've talked about in the past. The first of which is the slope-intercept form for an equation, y equals mx plus b. Now, we don't always, we're not always able to use slope-intercept form if we're given some data. Oftentimes, we have to use a different equation and get our answer into slope-intercept form after doing a little bit of work. So the other things that we need to make sure that we recall is how to fi figure out slope because sometimes they just give us two points and they don't give us the slope. So we can use those two points to find the slope by taking the y2 minus y1 divided by the x2 minus the x1. And then, like I said, other times we have to use an equation where we don't know the y-intercept and that's the point slope form of an equation or of a line. And that equation is y minus the y1 value equals your slope times, in parentheses, the x minus the x1 value. Um, so the y1 and the x1 there refer to specific, a specific coordinate. Like I said, this should all be reviewed to you. Um, and, but oftentimes people forget how to, when to use certain equations, uh, when to use the slope-intercept form, and when is it appropriate to use the point-slope form. And that's why I have these pieces up here in green. The only time that we're going to use the slope-intercept form is if you know at least the y-intercept. If you know the y-intercept and the slope, then obviously you can use the slope-intercept form. If you know the y-intercept and you know another point, well, we can use that y-intercept as a coordinate uh, where x is 0 and y is whatever the y-intercept is, and then use the other coordinate they give you to find the slope of the line, and then use that information in the point-slope form. Otherwise, if they don't give, I'm sorry, the, the slope-intercept form. Otherwise, if they don't give you the y-intercept, you can't start by just plugging the numbers into the slope-intercept form. The only time we can do that, like I said, is if we know the y-intercept. So if they just give you any two random coordinates, one of which is not the y-intercept, then we have to use the point-slope form. And we have to start by finding the slope. Or if they give you the slope and they give you the point, but the point they give you, again, is not the y-intercept, you have to use the point-slope form. So let's look at an example here where we're going to have to use some of these equations um, and review some of what we know uh, about linear equations. Um, again, if you don't have my notes, you don't have to worry about writing down this huge table of numbers. We're just going to look at this example and use the data from the table to create an equation. So let's look at that example now. So in this example, we're looking at jewelers and we're looking at the carat weight for diamonds and the price for the, those particular diamonds. And in the story problem here, it says jewelers emphasize the price of a diamond is determined by the cut, carat weight, color, and clarity. The table gives the carat weights and approximate uh, prices in U.S. dollars for 20 diamond rings. And then the data are graphed below. So again, what they've done is they've taken this uh, table of values and they've put it over here in the, um, uh, and made a scatter plot for that data. And this red line there is not connecting the points per se. What that red line represents is your line of best fit. And in a second, we're going to come up with an equation for a line that would fit some of this, or fit this data. And that's, again, that's exactly what they ask right here. It says, find the equation of the line through the point 0 0.18600 and 0 0.32400, 1400, which relates weight and prices. Now, the way that we would read this, is understand this, is that the 0 0.18 represents your independent variable, which is the, the carat weight of the diamond, and the y value represents the cost of that diamond in U.S. dollars. So a 0.18 diamond would have costed $600, where a 0.32 carat weight diamond would cost $1,400. And we want to come up with an equation that would re, uh, relate these two points with their weight and their price. So here's how we set that up. Your first step is to figure out, well, what is your slope? So again, we're going to use this coordinate here as your x1 and your y1, and I'll use this as my x2 and my y2. Meaning this is my first x value, my first y value, this would be my second x value, my second y value. So when we go to find the slope, we're going to subtract those y values. So I'll have 1,400 minus the 600. Divide that by my carat weight, so the 0.32 minus the 0.18. Now when we subtract the 1,400 minus 600, that gives us 800. Oops. 
gives us the 800. And subtracting the carat weights gives us 0.14. If I divide those out, I get approximately, if I round to the nearest uh, cent, I get, or hundredth, I should say, 5,714.29. Now, even though they were not, we're still on part A, I just want to talk about slope for a second because the next part actually asks us to interpret what the slope of the line means in the context of the problem. Here's how you can do that. Think about your slope, remember, is a ratio. It's a fraction relating the numerator to the denominator. Now, in the numerator, the 1,400 and the 600 represents the cost that we're paying. Now, you can think of that fraction bar as the word per. And the denominator represents the carat weight. So what we have here for part B, again, we're not done with part A. We'll come back to that in a second. But what we have here in part B with the slope is that we have the cost per carat weight. Or another way to look at it is the $5,714.29 is how much it costs for every uh, carat, or as you increase each carat weight by one, the cost increased by $5,714.29. Because remember, a carat is going to be a rather large, dark, large diamond, because here, the largest diamond that we're dealing with, I think, is 0.35 of a carat. Okay, but anyhow, back to part A. So now, to finish this out, now we need to come up with our equation. Well, remember that equation, the y minus the y1 equals your slope times x minus the x1. That does not mean that I'm tied into using this as my x1 and y1. If I wanted to, I could use the other coordinate as my x1 and y1. It doesn't matter which coordinate as I use as long as I'm consistent. And if I pick the x1 from one, I don't go and pick the y2 from the other. I have to pick the x1 and the y1, both numbers from that coordinate, or use both numbers from the other coordinate. So let's plug these in and see what we get. So we get y minus the 600 equals my slope times x minus my x1, which is 0.18. Now the next step is to distribute, because we want to simplify this equation. So I'm going to distribute that value, our slope through. So when I distribute my, distribute my slope through, I get 5,714.29x minus 1,028.57. My next step is to add 600 to both sides. So when I add 600 to both sides, this is what I get as my final equation. And there's your final answer. That is your equation in slope-intercept form. So now we can use that equation to come up with a prediction. Now notice how it says in part C, part C, use the model. Our equation that we come up with are to predict values, we can call that the model. So if they don't say to write an equation, if they say to ask you to find a model, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for an equation. But in this case, we're going to use that model to estimate the price of a 0.3 carat diamond ring. So I'm going to put 0.3 in for x. And when I do that on my calculator, I get an answer of 1,000. 285.71, or $1,285.71 is how much it would cost for a 0.3 carat diamond ring. Now it says, why is the model not good for predicting the cost of a 0.05 carat diamond ring? Well, I'll just tell you that if you put this into the equation, you end up getting negative $142.86. So what that would represent is that you'd go in there to buy a 0.05 carat diamond ring and they would owe you that much money, which doesn't make any sense. So the reason why this is not a good model is it doesn't give us good predictors for lower or smaller carat values. It looks like it's only better for some of the larger carat values. And it says why, in part E, why is the set of data not a function? Well, in the previous video for the previous lesson, we learned about functions. Remember, a function is where each value for x is paired up with a different value for y. Well, here I can see that I have 0.17, that value for x, that carat weight, has two different values for y. It has two different prices, $517.50 and $529.50. Or you can see here that there's a carat weight of 0.15, and here's another one of 0.15, both having different values. And the reason why, you might wonder, well, why is it, that doesn't seem fair. Why would one person buying uh, a 0.17 carat diamond pay $529.50? 
where a different person buys the same carat weight and get, pays a cheaper price. That doesn't seem fair. Well, the reason why, again, is that the price is not determined just by the carat weight. It's also determined by the color, clarity, and the cut. So maybe one diamond has got more of a yellow hint to it, so meaning it's not as clear of a diamond, so it's going to be a little bit cheaper. So that could be the case in this, in this scenario. Why don't you guys go ahead and try this next example on your own? So this is a completely different problem. Uh, I'm guessing these are years 1972 and 10.15. We don't know what this is about per se, but uh, come up with an equation that is for a line that's going to pass through these two points. So that's going to be just like what we just did in the part A of the previous problem. So try this one on your own. So pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. And you should have gotten this as your answer. Your slope, by the way, if you didn't get this exact answer, it could have been that maybe you uh, we rounded differently. I just rounded to the nearest hundredth. It just made it easier for me to do this, work out this problem. Um, if you use more numbers past the decimal, it just means that you're more accurate. Your answer is more accurate than mine, but you would have gotten approximately y equals negative 0.01x plus about 30. So if you had about 31 or 32 there, it just means you use more numbers past the decimal. Now, and if you notice, I use the coordinate for when x is 2004 and y is 9.8. And chances are you might have used this first one. That's why I did the 2004 value. Just so you could see that if you uh, use the other coordinate, you'd still end up with the same answer. Now, everything that we've been doing so far has been an example of interpolation. Interpolation is where we make a prediction between known values. Because if you look back at the table on the previous page, you would see that the smallest value is I think like 0.15 or 0.12 rather, and the largest uh, carrot was 0.35. So any of the predictions that we've made have been between those two values. And so those would be examples of interpolations. Now let's say if we wanted to make a prediction uh, beyond the known values, that would be what's called extrapolation. So that would be the example, like they said, the 0 0.05, that was a smaller value than what we had, so that was extrapolation. Or if I had collected data over the past 20 years looking at uh, gas prices over the last 20 years, and if I used that data to create an equation, and if I wanted to go back and estimate what the gas prices would have been in the year 2004 without looking at my data and just using that equation, that would be an example of interpolation. But if I wanted to use that same equation to predict what the gas price would have been in the year 2020, that would be a situation where I'd be extrapolating my data. I'd be looking for a number outside of the data that I would have been able to collect. So you want to make sure you understand those terms, interpolation and extrapolation. Which brings us to our next term, which is dealing with residuals. Now, before we could talk about residuals, we need to know what it means by observed values and predicted values. The observed values is the, are the numbers that you'd collect, like whether it's looking at a table or looking at doing a survey. Uh, those are your observed amounts. Those are your observed values because we can see them. Makes sense. Now, your predicted values are where we would use the same uh, um, independent variable, but then predict what the dependent variable would be. For example, looking at those carat weights for the diamonds. We knew some specific situations, some specific examples, so those would be our observed data. Now, for a carat weight of 0.25, I might have an observed value. Well, what I could do is I could figure out, well, what would be the predicted value? Using the equation we came up with, how much would we predict a quarter carat diamond to be worth? And that would give us our predicted value. And if I subtract the observed value minus the predicted value in that order, so we're subtracting the predict predicted value from the observed, that gives you the residual. So for example, let's say if we had a 0.16 carat diamond ring that we know sold for $507. So that's a specific, that's observed value. We can use the formula to figure out what it would also be for the model. So we can use the 0.16, plug it into the equation, and figure out what the predicted amount would be. And we can use that to figure out then what is the residual going to be. So let's start by putting the 0.16 into my equation. So it'd be y equals this. And 
And if you were to plug that in on your calculator, you'd end up getting $485.71. Now, that's just what our predicted value would be. So our actual value is $507. Our predicted value was less than that. The residual will tell us how much less our um, predicted value is, or you can look at it as how much more our observed value is. However you want to look at it, either way is fine. So we're going to take the $507, subtract from that your predicted. And when you do that, we get $21.29. So our observed is $21.29 more than our predicted. So it's $21.29 more than what we predicted. So why don't you go ahead and try this next one on your own and find the residual value for this. Again, it's supposed to be a 0.33 carat diamond, not a 33 carat diamond. That would be huge. Uh, but a 0.33 carat diamond. Figure out what um, the predicted value would be if we knew the observed value for that diamond was $1,417.50. So why don't you guys go ahead and try this one on your own. So pause the video like you did before and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. Okay, so let's see if you got this as your answer. So again, you should have gotten $1,457.14 here as the, um, that's what we would expect or that's what we would predict to have to pay for a 0.33 carat diamond. However, you can see that the observed, the actual uh, selling price was $1,417.50. So in this case, our selling price, or our observed, was less than our predicted. So that's what the negative represents there for your residuals, the fact that our observed was less than the predicted value. So you could say this a couple of ways. You could say that it was approximately $40. The observed value is approximately $40 less than our predicted value. Or you could say your predicted value was about $40 more than your observed value. Either way would be fine. Now that brings us to our last point which is this idea of the sum of the squared residuals. If you recall from the previous chapter when we found the variance, the variance was the sum of the square of the deviations from the mean. Well, this is very similar to that. This is finding the sum of the squared residuals. And so let's look at how we'd write this using summation notation. So here we have, this is telling us that we start with the first term in our sequence to the last term in our sequence. Over here to the right tells us what those values are going to be, that, or what we're going to do with those values as we add them up. So this tells you that you would take your first observed value minus your first predicted value, take that difference and square it. So then we would take the next value, your second observed value, minus your second predicted value, take that difference and square it, and continue to add those numbers together, all the way up to the last term last observed value minus the last predicted value squared. Add all those together and that would give you the sum of the squared residuals. Now what does that tell us? Well that's what's highlighted here that's important for you to understand that it gives us the lack of fit or how it differs from the uh, line of best fit. If we're comparing two, inf two sets of information and one has a smaller sum of squared residuals than another, then the one with the smaller sum of squared residuals is closer to that line of best fit so it's a better better fit to the data. So the larger that sum of the squared residuals is, is, means that the further those points are away from that line of best fit. So again, kind of like the standard deviation tells us how close each value is from the mean, this is giving us the difference each value is from that line of best fit. So that pretty much ends our lesson here. So um, hopefully after watching this video, you have a better understanding of how to find an equation of a line and how to I find the sum of the squared residuals. So with that, good luck now on your assignment.